Hello, hi, Ken. I'm very happy to welcome you, even though you cannot be in Hungary again. We were very fortunate that you visited in 2019. And I would like to introduce everybody, Kenneth Rogoff, who is a grandmaster. Probably not many of you know it, but also, of course, most people probably know that you're an economist and the former chief economist of IMF and the leader talking with everybody, all the leaders and decision making makers in the world. So welcome, Ken. Well, thank you so much. It's, it's such a pleasure to see you, even if only virtually. And yes, uh, I came to the Polgar Festival, uh, what seems like a hundred years ago, but it was only two. Uh, and it was an incredible experience, uh, really uh, quite remarkable. Uh, of course, your influence <clears throat> on chess and on people, uh, but also just the spectacle that you put together is really so impressive. Thank you very much for your kind words. Uh, before I uh, like to start to chat with you and talk about your chess life and scientific life, I'd like to first uh, point out to the audience why we are here and what is the reason. The reason is because the Judith Polgar Chess Foundation established four years ago the Goodwill Ambassador of Chess Awards, and which is for we handing it out to notable figures that have enriched and expresses the values of chess. So this is the occasion when I would like to give you the Goodwill Ambassador of Chess and Science Diploma and also we will be happy to send you over the glass trophy which we also specially make for on your name so i do hope that when you're going to receive it you're going to remember us that we really appreciate all the effort and all the good you do in your scientific word but spreading chess that how great it is thank you so much judith i'm so honored uh I'm, of course, a huge fan of yours as a chess player uh, and also all you've done for chess. So I'm just incredibly flattered uh, by having my name on an award where yours also appears. Thank you. So my first question would be that uh, when, uh, when we met in person in 2016 at the World Championship match when Magnus Carlsen played against Karyakin, and, uh, and then we had the opportunity to talk and uh, you to told me a little bit about your chess career and it was so impressive. And uh, practically you were a great chess talent who dropped out from school to be a professional chess player, at least for some time when you were 16 years old. How was that? Well, um, first of all, my chess career was very short. I really only, I learned the moves when I was probably seven from my father, but I didn't really start playing till I was 13. And in the United States, there really were not so many opportunities to play strong players. There weren't many uh, strong tournaments at all compared to in Europe. And I, I realized that if I wanted to learn from the best and to get better myself, uh, I needed to do something radical. And that gave me the idea to sort of go over to Europe and see if I could play in some tournaments and what would happen. It, it was quite an adventure, I must say. I won't go into all the details, but uh, I was living on my own, uh, going in Yugoslavia, Spain, England, uh, sort of making ends meet as a chess player. I'm sure you know all, you know, know many people who do that. And, uh, but I, I learned a great deal during that period. It was an incredibly interesting period and about chess, people, history. Uh, it, was a, it was a fantastic experience. So how was it exactly? You were, as a teenager, you were traveling alone in Europe and discovering? Yeah, you, you could do that back then in a way that I think is not possible today. Uh, maybe, you know, there were things that weren't so safe and I didn't know it, uh, but it was, it was a different time uh, than it is today. I would not let my children do that. Uh, of course, my, my, I have to say my uh, uh, wife, Natasha, did even crazier things and she wouldn't let her children do that either. But uh, no, I mean, I, I did everything from sometimes I was, I was playing in really good tournaments and 
living in a five star hotel and the next you know week I might be sleeping in a train station on my way to somewhere uh, and it just felt normal uh, as a kid and uh, you know I, I didn't plan it I didn't think it through but uh, I, I learned a lot from it and how were the tournaments back then because uh, obviously the preparation was not with the computer mm -hmm. no engine it's only did you have friends in the chess world that you were hanging out with and who you were working as a sparing partner when you were in Europe? So not, not so much. <clears throat> I certainly learned from people at the tournaments, we would go over our games. So Pal, the great Palbenko uh, was at some of the tournaments I was at. Uh, Lubievich uh, played in some of the tournaments I played in it. Uh, Jan Timmen. Uh, there are many, many great players, and we'd sort of hang out and study chess and go over games. We were starting to have the informants then, these big encyclopedias, which I would read, but I, I didn't have a second. That was a luxury that I couldn't even imagine back then. Americans didn't. The players from Eastern Europe had them a bit. Uh, and of course, there were no computers. And so, you know, it was, uh, it was a very different time in chess. I, I have to tell you, one of the things of having lived so long after that is I studied chess so much. And I, I knew there were greater chess players than I, starting with Bobby Fischer. Uh, but I, I thought I knew a lot about chess. I thought I knew the end games. I thought I studied deeply the openings. I thought I knew tactics. And, you know, as the years go on, I sort of realized I knew nothing. I mean, the uh, mysteries that have unfolded, what people have discovered, uh, your own games are just incredibly creative, uh, but also, you know, what's happened with studying with computers and learning. Uh, and, and I think it's been very encouraging to me as a scientist, as an economist, because it, it's often you feel, oh, I looked at that problem. I know everything about it. And what I, I learned from the chess experience is you never know everything about it. There's always more layers to unfold. Well, definitely, I think uh, this is one of the key elements for chess players who actually later on to go on other fields mm -hmm. that uh, I'm doing many other things myself. Uh, but whenever, whatever I'm doing, I have still this critical thinking, how to get better, how to be careful not to get uh, overestimated if whatever situation there is, right? Because you know that you can blunder something, things can go wrong, go out of your control. And uh, I think this, this uh, comes back again and again when I talk with people who stepped out from chess and do other things. Well, absolutely. I mean, it certainly teaches you a humility about what you can know. I mean, sort of famously in physics today, you know, when I was a kid, we learned about electrons and protons and they said, oh, there are more particles than that. And then, you know, they find out that on top of, uh, on top of that, there are, there, there are more particles even than they realized uh, had, had, had existed. And, you know, the latest is that there's still more. And I think, uh, many things in life are like that. Chess is like that. There, there are many things I, I learned from chess. And I, I would say another thing that's really important is you learn to think clearly in tense situations, which is often the hardest to think clearly, but chess demands that. You learn to think clearly after you make a mistake that a really good player pulls themselves together, plays the position on the board, and yet, you know, it's so tempting to just keep making the same mistake. Now, I, th I think chess teaches you a lot about life that's useful in so many ways. Well, going back a little bit when you were 16 years old, uh, it was Bobby Fischer who wrote a few lines and an article about your performance. And I would read up what he wrote, okay? The player impressed me the most was the 16 years old Ken Rogoff from Rochester. What I liked about Ken, who won the championship, was his self-assured style and his knowing exactly what he wanted over the chessboard. How did you 
react and what feelings did you have when Bobby was writing uh, something like this about you and it was clear that he was not the person who was phrasing a lot of people, I think, at the time and also later on. So even though I was only 16 years old and not the most mature person in so many ways, I understood what that meant. I had noticed he thought Karpov was not so good. And he was saying, I was really good. My interpretation was, I don't have to worry about Ken Rogoff. Uh, he's no concern, you know, a nice player, but he'll never beat me. That's how I read those lines. Okay, so you were somehow reading in between the lines, right? But yeah, still, no, it was, not, it was nice, but, but I understood that, you know, he wouldn't be saying that if he thought he might be losing to me in a game tomorrow. <laughs> okay, so let's see the one of your games, if you don't mind. I brought it up here, which I want to share with our viewers, just to show really a little bit from your chess past, which was a few decades ago, right? So this was actually Many. specifically the game which uh, Bobby chose for the article when you played with the white pieces against Steve Spencer. And uh, you are playing with the white pieces and you realized it, that actually it's action time. So you went knight f7, king f7, rook e6. Do you remember the situation when you played yeah, this? Yeah, well, I, I mean, so I, 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 I think I only needed to draw to win the tournament at this point. And, uh, but I, you know, I, I sort of knew I was winning here because of knight d5, rook takes c6, uh, and his possession falls apart. Um, and so there's no way for him to, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to recover the piece and win a lot of material no matter what he does. Yes, and black played knight e8, you went rook f6, black resigned because after king e7, you would give checkmate just in a few moves. Right? So at the Indeed. time when you, won the, when you won the championship, were you had in your, did you have in your head that you're going to be professional player? I'm, I mean, I, I, don't know that I thought in those terms, but I was very passionate about chess. I thought about it all the time. Uh, and I, I think I wanted, <clears throat> I wanted to continue going to school, but I kind of realized this isn't going to work. I, I need to get better. I need to understand things. So yeah, I, I was, I was very happy playing chess. I, I think you have to remember Judith in those days, the examples of professional chesslers was very limited. Uh, it still is today, but I, I think there's a much broader definition of being a professional. A lot of the top players who were professional lived behind what we called the Iron Curtain, uh, and they had support from the state. Uh, Bobby Fischer was a rare bird back then of being really a successful professional. Many of the others did something else on the side. Uh, Lombardi was a priest, uh, you know, it, Etc. And so, you know, it's, it, I have to say, it's been very interesting to me that Bobby was so wanting the world to respect professional players and so wanting to be treated as a professional. Uh, he had, a, he had actually a lot of ideas about it. And I, I think he would admire a lot of what's going on today. For example, that Magnus Carlsen is doing, I think, is in deepening the path to be a professional. But you now, back then, you were uh, an artist, really and you had to be prepared to be a starving artist. But like all starving artists, you think it's worth it. <laughs> well, before I ask my, my further questions, I wanted to share also this game of yours, which you played a few years later against Ribley. Was it the Interzonal or it was the Youth World Championship? No, this was uh, in Athens, uh, I think 1971 in the uh, yes. World Under 21 Championship. And I just mentioned Ribley was, he's Hungarian, was really one of the couple favorites. And we arrived at this position. I played an opening uh, Bishop B5 check on the third move to avoid the Knight Orp, which was considered utterly insipid and toothless back then, serious players didn't do it. I, I needed to play openings like that because I didn't have trainers, I didn't have a coach. I had to be afraid of opening innovations. 
uh, but I, I was prepared to take this quieter road uh, in order to avoid the opening. I mean, that may sound very modern 50 years later. Uh, Magnus Carlsen does that a lot, but back then you were considered a wimp if you did that, but that was my style. Yes, chess changed quite a bit, which we, we're going to discuss a bit later. You went 95 check, black takes, mm -hmm. takes, and now black made the really passive move, which actually cost him the game, I guess, because black went 98. And after that, rook d8 was a decisive move, I think, of the game because of the pin here. The knight is pinned and it cannot come out. So right now, immediately you were threatening to capture the g7 pawn, right? Mm -hmm. To take it. Black played f6. You went bishop b8. But I liked very much the technique you were doing. You played f4, just taking space as much as possible. Improve your position. Even though maybe you had an easier win, possibly, but you just really started to play improving your peace play, then improved your king, your pawn on the right, on the queen side. Probably you were enjoying a lot that you can just do whatever you want because black cannot come out from the box on the eighth rank. Well, there's no, ru there's no rush because he's in a bind. And so, um, you know, you prepare before you take decisive action. Yeah, I mean, here you could already go with the rook to d7, right? And then take on h7. But you were still playing king g2 very quietly. King c6, you went h3. This I liked. <laughs> like, really rook optimizing would have been everything. A better move, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, you did it the move later, right? And then uh, just in a few moves, uh, black had to resign because of the material down and after this rook a8. So what do you think about your style? If you look it back, what was your style? Were you pro uh, positional more or tactics? Which part of the game you were happy to play? So I never had the capacity to go in for the kind of tactics you did. I was a pretty good tactician. I mean, I don't think there were many players who could calculate more deeply, but there were some. I remember uh, losing a game to Lubyevich. Uh, you know, I think when I was still 16 or 17, he was a couple of years older. And I thought I had calculated really deeply. And he said, well, show me what you calculated. And so I give my best. And then he said, oh, that's nice. And then he goes five more moves, you know, with what he saw. I think I was alert to positional tactics. But I, I, I like to play end games. I mean, I think was something I was comfortable with, which was a, a lot of players my age didn't at the time. Now it's normal. But back then you wanted to be very muscular, attack the opponent, get a crushing win. Uh, and the idea of playing quieter openings and being happy uh, with having a slightly better end game was alien to most most of people my age and even you know i'd say even players in their 20s didn't favor that style and that that was but i i think i was very comfortable with tactics but not at a level where i could beat the very best that way uh well and then there was a point when uh, you decided to quit chess yeah. and go to somewhere else and switch to economics how did it come to how did you come to that decision and why <clears throat> well it's, i mean it's a long story but it was a painful process and i have to say i've always felt had i stuck with chess i would have been perfectly happy um i love chess i love chess now uh but i i basically came to the conclusion that i couldn't do both. And I had to make a choice. And I have to say when uh, uh, young professionals come to me and say, I want to go into something else, I impress upon them, you know, think how hard you had to work to get to where you are at chess. You, you need to give a similar focus and concentration to your other vocation if you're going to try something else. And it, it was a transition. I don't, I didn't find it easy. I wasn't, uh, quickly writing interesting papers in economics. It took time to grow and mature and get ideas, just like it does in chess. But you didn't regret it, I guess. Excuse me? 
you didn't regret it that you switched? Uh, no, I mean, you know, we all choose these forks in the road on so many things in life. And uh, no, I, I, I wouldn't say I regretted it, but I, as I said, I know that I would not have regretted it either had I gone the other way. I think it was a very difficult decision. And I think what I did to, to decide you've got to try to focus on one or the other was important. I, I think about chess a lot now. It's a very addictive for me in a, in a positive way. And I think if I'd been playing tournaments every other weekend or occasionally playing tournaments, I, I would just be thinking about chess. It would push out space to be creative and something else. Maybe not everybody's that way, but I, I, I think that's what I decided. So what do you think, uh, we were touching a little bit this topic already in the beginning, that what chess gave you and what you learned from chess and what you could uh, implement also in economics. What were the critical moments when you went back to the roots and you said, okay, with, with my chess knowledge, with my attitude, with my, with my perseverance, with all the things I've learned there, that uh, it's so good because it was very useful in some special situation? Well, I think there are many things. It's hard to put my finger on a single one. Uh, one fairly straightforward thing is chess teaches you to think strategically. And some of my work uses what's called game theory, which is really a form of mathematics. But it came to me very naturally. I'm not great at mathematics but I could intuit the ideas very quickly. And I think, you know, the years and years of thinking about chess was helpful. Um, certainly, I mentioned at the beginning, uh, the experience of being away from chess and watching it develop made me realize that, you know, you, you tend to focus on the little problem ahead of you and you think you know everything about it. You never do. It's always changing. It's always morphing. And chess really taught me a lot about that. Uh, and of course, there were many things in, in life uh, um, in uh, teaching you to be calm in tense situations. And I've faced many in my life, as we all do. And I, I think uh, chess really trains you to remain calm. I mean, I mean the same thing's true of a great uh, football player, uh, you know, they the other side just scored a goal and you've got to not get depressed about the fact that a goal just happened or you're a goalie and you allowed the goal and go on to the next one. But I think in chess, it's even harder because you had a whole strategy for getting to the position where you made the mistake. And so it, I think it, it, you know, it teaches you, it teaches you a lot. And of course, I think for young people, the discipline of learning and studying, uh, learning to learn from other people, uh, th I think it's really a wonderful thing. Uh, would you advise to kids to to learn the game? Are your kids uh, playing chess a bit? The, uh, absolutely, they learned to play chess, uh, and they were both pretty good at it. Uh, they moved on to other things. They may come back to chess, but yeah, I, I encourage it. Uh, I, I encourage everyone to consider it. Of course, everyone's different, but what at least. I, I mean, I, you can tell me if you think this is true, but I certainly thought it, have thought it was true for a long time that a lot of people who think they're not smart find they're really good at chess because maybe for some, particularly with children, you know, maybe they have some attention deficit syndrome or something that makes them, you know, fidget in school, but then they can really pull it together in chess. And it's, I, and then I'm really stretching myself speaking in your presence, but I also say that you can adopt your style. You can have, you can have, be good at remembering things. You can be good at calculating. You can be good at positional chess. And it's a, it's a little maybe like tennis of you can adopt your style to what you're good at. And uh, it's a way to learn about yourself. So I think, I think a lot of people find uh, that they didn't think they could possibly be good at chess and they are. And that's very empowering. And so I think, you know, maybe you won't find that. There are lots of things I've tried that I wasn't good at, but uh, I, I think it's something uh, children should try. And I think it's way better than 
being on Instagram or playing video games, uh, it's, it's a way healthier uh, thing to do. Well, it's, uh, it's clear that chess gives, uh, I think, to a lot of people, a lot of uh, great skills. And I have many friends and I speak with a lot of decision makers, doctors, lawyers, who just play chess in their spare time. And they do believe that they make better decisions and they understand things better. And they apply some of the strategies which they do on the chessboard in their business life. So this is something uh, exciting. Of course, uh, well, we were discussing this in our private talk some time ago when uh, the Queen's Gambit series came out, right? Just a year ago. And uh, I think we never had, maybe the last time we had such a great chess boom in the world in 72 when Bobby Fischer played with Boris Spassky, but that was a political uh, issue kind of with the Cold War, right? And now I see that with this series, suddenly everybody, even the people who were absolutely not interested about the game, they were so far, far away from chess, they come in and they start start learning the game and they actually enjoying it of course internet gives all the possibility for doing so what do you think about the effect of this and how long is it going to stay well there's no question that the effect of the combination of the pandemic and the queen's gambit uh, has led to an explosion of interest in chess I meet so many uh, colleagues, friends who sheepishly tell me they're playing chess all the time now. And I don't know how much of it was the pandemic, how much of it was the Queen's Gambit. The Queen's Gambit we've discussed, Judith, I, th I think is just brilliant. Uh, Walter Chavis came to the 1975 US Chess Championship in Oberlin where I played. There's actually a scene uh, in both the book and the, the, the uh, TV series, the Netflix uh, films that cover that. Um, and so I, I've been giving away the book for 20 years. I thought it was just, you know, incredibly brilliant. And I, I think it's, it's done a lot. Uh, it's uh, portrayed chess in, I think, a very different way. And I, I will also just make a comment about one of the things I thought was brilliant about it was how it portrays thinking. So many people uh, when they want to portray someone thinking they have them struggling and you know i can't I, how can i think? and but the truth of the matter is you usually do that when you can't think clearly and instead uh anna taylor uh joy playing beth Harmon sort of stares and yeah sometimes she looks at the ceiling and you know sees mirages but she's just staring and that's i i think much more realistic i, I think it will be very influential yeah, this uh, I love the series and I love also the effect of that. Well, of course, COVID uh, made the world different. I don't know what you think about the economics, <laughs> what it did to uh, to the world. Maybe you can share your actual viewpoint on that. Uh, do, do we have any positive uh, future uh, perspectives? Well, I mean, it's, it's of course, terrible and uh, it's you know, had an effect on, I can go on for a long time about that, about all the children who've lost time in school, uh, you know, all the people who've been sick and passed away, uh, people who've lost their jobs. It's been, it's been the worst thing in my lifetime. Uh, I'd say you'd have to go back to the Great Depression of the 1930s to find something as devastating, not just on the economic numbers, but on, you know, how we feel and, and such. But there are positive sides to it. I think it may push ahead um, the evolution of communication work. Uh, certainly we're speaking by Zoom. I wish I was speaking to you in person, but this also is very enjoyable. And there, there are many things taking advantage of that. Probably there are many kinds of work that will never be the same, where you'll go into work two days a week and three days a week That'll lead to cities being reorganized, maybe people having more time with their families. So it, 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 it also accelerated a push to the future in, in some ways that are good, I wouldn't, you know, universally, uh, but uh, 
No, I'm, I'm quite optimistic going forward that we're going to get over this and it will eventually be over and we will have learned something from it. Uh, but it, it was uh, it was a very difficult period for all of us to go through. Well, I think, of course, it's a huge test in many ways to us, but uh, it's really testing how resilient we are and how much we are able to adopt ourselves uh, into new situations, which I believe chess is something gives a good mindset that you have to be ready for different situations and from a bad position that you recover or you have a good position and you just make a blunder and you have to go on. And this is what I feel that nowadays everybody should go on, whether it's good or bad, and somehow hang on there and have the perseverance to to, to get themselves together and turn things on the better roads. What do you think about chess? Because chess was a sport which actually one of the very few which actually, I can't say profited out of it, but uh, who survived the sport itself, right? Because of the online possibilities that we played online chess, online tournaments, online teaching, camps. I mean, everything, whatever, obviously physical sport you're not able to do online. But I was also doing a lot of chess activities online. So what do you think, what did it do to our sport and what can it give for the future? Well, first, let me second the first remark you made about giving people resilience. You know, when I grew up, my my parents had lived through the Second World War and other privations, the Great Depression. And, you know, my generation just knew nothing by comparison to that. Uh, We had our own fears of nuclear war and such, but we hadn't lived through the same things. And I I think that's even more true of young people today where they really don't know what it is to live through something very difficult. And now they do. And uh, I think, you know, it may, it will make them stronger, make them more resilient. And, and, you know, in some ways that that's a good thing. And so I second that. Yeah. Chat chess is really internet friendly. Yes. I understand their issues having to do, <clears throat> Excuse me. I understand their issues having to do with preventing cheating and such, but chess is always at the cutting edge of presenting things on the internet. Uh, it was very early on in you know how to bring people in, how to bring conversations, things that are very common now. And chess is always sort of a mover to a head, and I think it has been. It's not just that. It's not just that chess. Uh, is internet friendly. It's that the chess community is very internet savvy and found so many ways to adapt and change things. And again, some of them perhaps for the better. I, I don't know what you think, but there is a case to be made that for the fans, having more chess be at a hot, faster speed is a lot more entertaining. And yes, you don't get quite the perfect games. You can't show it 15 years later in the same way. You don't get quite the same artistry, but it's fun. And uh, I I think sort of forcing that on chess and making the chess authorities realize, wow, people love this uh, has been really beneficial. Yes, uh, it's good that you're bringing this up because lately I was also making some commentaries and discussing with people and I sometimes wonder where chess is leading to, where it's going to be in 10 years time. And sometimes I tend to think that the sport itself is going towards in the direction you just mentioned to make the games shorter, to make more sportive more entertaining, more fun for the audience to to make uh, the audience being more involved and and uh, uh, to get engaged because if it's a shorter time, then of course more people can follow it because they they don't have so much time, right? But I don't know what you think if if it's really going to go in that direction that uh, we're going to have shortening uh, time controls in in big events and entertaining events. Look, I, you're 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 in the thick of it. I I have no idea. I certainly think the great classical games are better, uh, but uh, you know, in some sense, you you have to 
ask what appeals to people. And also there is the cheating issue. And I think going to a faster time control makes it a little easier to deal with that. I, I'd be, maybe I'm being very naive here uh, in thinking that, but I, I, I don't know. But, you know, I have to say um, when I stopped playing chess in the late seventies, I think I gave an interview in chess life and I was asked, uh, I, I think I was asked about, you know, the future of the world championships and what would happen. I said, well, you know, I saw uh, Karpov and Kasparov coming to play and maybe this was in 1980, uh, coming to play in the 1980s. And I said, when they play, that's going to be the last uh, great match between two humans. And uh, that was my comment about it. Uh, it's in chess life. And I was wrong. And it's amazing how resilient chess has been. It's exciting. At least it seems that way to me uh, watching it. And I think to most people, the it, it, actually, there's so many areas of life where computers are coming in. They're substituting for us. They're seemingly doing things better. And the fact that chess has been able to adopt and be in some ways stronger than ever uh, is encouraging. I'm again, I don't know where we'll be in a hundred years, but I think in 10 years, it's encouraging that there are all these walks of life where people are afraid AI will destroy their livelihoods. Um, it's it's going to change things, but it may not change things as much for the nearly for the worse as people think. Yeah, of course, that's uh, that's an endless topic. Uh, what uh, AI did to chess. But of course, it gave a great deal of excitement, I think, with the Alpha Zero, especially in the last few years, which I find uh, very interesting that it gave, I think, extra motivation or inspiration. It's more of inspiration, even to Magnus Carlsen, I think, because I, I can see some of the patterns Alpha Zero does that uh, like pushing the side pawns, sacrificing material for a very long term uh, compensation. So, yeah, some people, of course, they think that uh, that the computer is just uh, killing the game. But I think we have more interesting games than ever. Well, uh, as I've told you before, Judith, there are a number of commentators who pointed out that the closest human to Alpha Zero's you, uh, that you had this <laughs> style a long time ago of sort of seeing uh, tactics and sacrifice for a long term gain. And yeah, it's, it's remarkable. I mean, the game's about the, it's been remarkable. Uh, you, again, even I'm sure Magnus Carlsen felt in a short period what took me a longer period to feel. He thought he knew everything and he sees these games and says, they're just these po endless possibilities I hadn't realized. It's inspiring. And uh, he's been inspired. I think other players have. And uh, again, you know, you bring this almost, dare I say, godlike machine uh, to play, and it's made people better. Uh, so maybe there'll be some other, hopefully many other areas of human endeavors where we're sort of afraid of AI, but we think will be made irrelevant, uh, but find that it enriches us. Well, as a closing, I would like to ask you what do you think about Magnus Carlsen playing against Nepomniachtchi just within a month. The uh, World Championship title match is going to be a little more, like two months. But what do you think? Who is the favorite? This is probably not a very difficult question. But what do you think? What is your estimation? How difficult and complicated and challenging match it will be for both of them? Well, I think people tend to forget that chess is a sport, it's human, and you can be much the better player, but lose. It happens all the time in sports. You can have a bad season in sports, even though you're a great team. And so it's at Magnus Carlsen's, of course, a strong favorite, uh, but you know his, his opponent is fantastic and formidable. And uh, the, it's, you know, anything can happen. That's why they have to play the match. What I, I hope that if, Ma if one of these days somebody comes along and wins a match against Magnus, he sticks with it and comes back. He won't necessarily have an automatic right, like in the days of Botvinnik 
uh, you know, in the 50s uh, had. But um, again, you know, I, I hope if something, I, he's an overwhelming favorite, he should win. But I hope that if for some reason something goes wrong, he's sick or whatever, that he doesn't just fold, but comes back to try to retake the title. Uh, he's still very young, but no, it's gonna it's a, it's gonna be wonderful for chess. I'm sure you'll be uh, you'll be there. Uh, I will try to come. I don't know if it's possible with my teaching, but I I think I'm gonna give a little talk uh, connected to it. Great. Well, Kent, thank you very much for your time and sharing your thoughts, your experiences on chess world, your chess experience. One final question to you. If you have to say something to the scientific word, world, what would you say to them? Why should they learn chess? What can it give to them? Well, I think chess gives you this incredible uh, discipline of thought and opportunity for creativity. I think what many scientists learn from chess is it's hard to calculate everything. Mathematicians often are not that great at chess. They can be very good, John Nunn, but still I think they often, they're so used to getting it exactly right. And there's an art element to chess. You, you know, things are always coming along that are different. So it opens your mind, emphasizes the importance of creativity on top of narrow calculation. And I, I think that's something everyone can learn from chess, even really great scientists. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and a great honor to speak with you. Thank you.